introduce ourselves. Many of you might know Michael from uh, Brian said it from the uh, Agile Coaching Institute work he was doing there. And um, I want to give you a little bit about my background as well, pretty briefly, just to get, give you context around um, that and, and why we started Transformation. So, what we're all about. Well, I, I could do that. Okay, go ahead. You want to do Sure. And so, um, we're going to introduce each other. Um, <clears throat> Michelle has been in the Agile space since about 2005. She's done work on large-scale transformations that entire time. She's worked for a lot of um, big companies that you know, uh, both clients and agile consulting companies. She started um, an agile consulting practice in a really large company, which is what was part of um, what drew me to her in terms of wanting to start a transformation and consultancy that she started the practice. <coughs> but I, I hadn't started a consulting practice before. Uh, she has a background in organization behavior, organization development, change management, coaching, and, um, and really importantly to me, she was a line manager before she did any of that. She uh, had an organization of uh, people that reported to her, and she did things that you really want your actual manager to do, which is to create a culture that's different from the rest. Whereas the rest of the organization was people who didn't really like it all that much. It was a call center. They all wanted to come work for her. You know, that's what we want in a leader is somebody that people want to follow. And that can create a space that's different. And that's what she was in. She's become, I've been writing a book for a long time called, uh, some of you have grown tired. God himself has grown tired of waiting for my book is what I had a revelation just the other, the other minute. Um, it used to be called Coaching the Agile Enterprise, and now it's called Transformation. And Michelle is my co-author on that because she's become uh, a collaborator in the deepest sense of that word of creating this framework. Thank you. So um, Michael. I met Michael back in 2005 when I first got started in Agile um, at a large transformation. And um, Michael was, uh, you know, the one that stood out, <laughs> a little different, a little eccentric, a little odd. But um, he was bringing thinking to the Agile space. Uh, and I was looking really kind of like a sponge, because I was pretty new, you know. So I was like a sponge trying to look at all these Agile coaches out there, like who what do I like from this, what do I like from that, and just kind of taking it all in, just absorbing and observing and watching a lot. And I learned a lot because we were on a, a, a large transformation that had probably 20, we had 20 something clients. I mean, uh, coaches on that client. So, you know, I got to see a lot of who are the thought leaders in Agile today. Um, many who have started their own companies, they're all, they're all branched out, they're all writing books, you know. So I was really fortunate to get exposed to that early on. And so I met Michael and he, um, I like the way he brought different uh, thinking into the Agile space because um, the one thing that I've seen over all of these years is that we need to bring different thinking in. It's because we need the leadership development <coughs> thinking. We need the organizational change thinking. And Michael was early on bringing that type of thinking, the integral thinking. So Michael was talking integral before anybody was really talking integral. Uh, and so uh, I was really drawn to, you know, to, to his way of being as a coach. And then we didn't see each other for a long time, and then we saw each other at an Agile conference uh, back in 2015. I think yeah, it was, yeah. And really started talking, and I was going through all these transformations and kind of the whole, the, the title is, you know, hitting your head against a wall, literally <laughs> feeling like my head was hurting from banging my head against a wall from so many tough Agile transformations. Wondering, yeah, how do we need to do this differently? And just feeling a sense of purpose around that. Met Michael, and we started uh, talking and aligning right now, right then. Michael has a really uh, uh, has always had a desire to to bring change about in a big way, and so he changed the game with as a coaching institute and how we think about coaching. Right, because coaches, everybody was hanging the sign of an agile coach on their door, and yet they didn't know anything about coaching. So Michael brought the professional coaching space into the Agile industry. 
um, which was really great. And so my thought is, wow, if we can bring the trans organizational change and organizational transformation thinking into the <coughs> transformation space along with that, that would be really powerful. So um, I just really aligned with his thinking and his purpose and uh, wanted to start something to, to really change the game. And that's how we kind of So that, when we started our company transformation, um, we, uh, Michelle had the slogan, transforming transformation. So just like changing the conversation about that for coaches, we want to change the conversation that you all have, that we all have together about what a transformation is. And it's not what most people talk about. What most people talk about is not a transformation. It's not an organizational transformation. It's an adoption, maybe. It's a bringing stuff on. It's installing something, maybe. But it's not a transformation. Yeah, so what are we really looking for? Because if there's you know, there's different kinds of change, and some change is all you really want. So if you're just trying to bring some practices in at the delivery team level, great. Now that's the kind of change. But that's not transformational change. That's different. So we want to do an agile transformation, and we want to, to expand our organizations to have more organizational agility or enterprise agility in support of innovation, right? That's a very different thing. That involves shifting culture and mindset, not just bringing these practices. So um, and how many people are in what is being called, uh, we don't want to create uh, cast dispersions, how many people are in what's called an agile transformation? Please, please drill greater ratio. Um, okay. Now, how many people were interested in that? You're not doing it, but you'd be interested. In it. How many people have done it in the past, but aren't doing it now? Okay. Three schools here. Cool. So at least this is going to speak to all of you in some way or form. That's, That's why you're here. <laughs> so what we think is that, well, let's, let's look at the data. <laughs> I get it once. So, um, how many people uh, have looked at the uh, the state of agile survey by version one? Before? So it looks like this every year, right? It does. At the top is company philosophy or culture at odds with. It's not kind of been this specific before, but at odds with agile core values. Right. So now they're talking also about scaling agile. Right, in terms of how, how do you scale Agile? How do you get to a more uh, to, to more organizational agility? Right, to a bigger so Now we're up to 63%. Um, the reason is because it's the company philosophy or the culture that are just at odds with core values. Or 45% lack of management support. Right, culture, leadership. Will well, you agree that those are big? Yes. And the other one, uh, general organizational resistance to change. We read that to mean you don't get change. You're trying to do it, but you don't understand it. Right. Because this is real organizational change. And there is a science behind organizational change. And how do you do that? There's also a science behind leadership, and there's a science behind culture, but we're not using those. An agile roadmap isn't going to give you organizational change. Right? That's a piece of it. So if you take the new thinking of agile practices, because it is new thinking, there's no question about it, and you put it in soil, that's the same old thinking. What's going to happen? You're going to get the same old answers, right? Transformation in and of itself means you want to break the status quo, right? You want to have a new results, breakthrough results. That's transformation. So if I need different results, breakthrough transformation, I can't use techniques that are status quo techniques. The problem is transformation is not easy. Like one of the um, things that I uh, am sober about is naming this company transformation. Yikes. It's a high bar because it, you know, it brings it on us. I'm telling you, it brings transformation in our face all the time. Like, you got to be willing to transform to like give up some things that you used to do. And that's not, I, I don't like it, frankly. I really don't like it. I like the results on the other side. I feel something about me is compelled to do it, but I don't really like it that much. <clears throat> so you got to be, you got to go into transformation from some real pain or some gigantic opportunity. You don't go in, oh yeah, sure, let's do a transformation. Yeah, whoa, whoa. That's, that, 
you're not getting transformation. And so the reason we say agile, you know, if you follow us at all, you'll, we talk a lot about that agile transformation starts with leaders. And it doesn't start with leaders saying, go do a transformation. <coughs> And the reason is because if you're doing a transformation, you're asking your organization to shift their thinking and to shift their, you know, their culture. So that means you also have to do it. You can't ask your organization to do something if you're not willing to do or you're not going to do with them. Are you going to, are you going to get support or buy-in that way? And have you seen leaders who say, yeah, this Agile thing is a great idea. Go install the Agile. Have you seen that? Have you yes. seen them say, I'm probably the problem. Let's start with me and then I'll, talk, I'll, I'll get back to you. Have you seen them do that? Oh. Not so much. <laughs> so how do we solve that dilemma? It's not, um, you know, just the people will say, oh, well, we need to give the leadership some training, right? And they only want to invest an hour and a half or a half day at most. Maybe we can get them to go some training. That's going to solve it, right? We, we just get that. leaders to sign up for this training session. We have that problem. We have that problem all the time, right? How many of you have that problem, right? So we point the finger. Leaders don't get it. You guys just don't get it. If you would get it, this thing would just go. So we've got uh, this model has um, four uh, sections to it: uh, practices and uh, behaviors over there, and uh, organization structure, architectures over there, and leadership's here and culture's there. Because we pay a lot of attention to the science behind how you actually shift and grow and mature leadership, and how you actually um, shift and design culture. So in the agile industry, we've been really, really good, and we're going to kind of move around and jump just as a way of kind of we're embodying gonna, what we're talking about. We're going to play Twister. Yeah, so in the agile industry, we've been really good at bringing methods over here. Right? Scrum, Kanban, you know, all great practices and methods. We've been great at it. And then we most, you know, in years of recent frameworks, how we can scale. So we've got safe and less and bad. We've been really good at bringing methods that we know will work if you just do them correctly, right? They'll just work. They're good, they're researched, proven methods. We're really good at that. What we haven't been so good at is bringing in methods that are scientific, research, proven ways of shifting culture and mindset. We have plenty of lectures about what people should do over here, don't we? We know how to tell them what they should do, but that's not the same as helping them be able to, they have to have the capacity to. So you might be using a change model like uh, ADCAR or um, Cotter or something like that, right? Pretty high level. And it says on there somewhere, you know, you've got to deal with culture. And I've been in these consulting companies where they're like, they'll put it out there, it's part of their playbook, part of the whole thing. Yes, culture. And then in bed in the back room, I'm going, okay guys, but what are we doing for this culture, you know, piece of it? They're like, good point, I'm not really sure how we actually go about and do that. But we know we need to do it, so we need to say it, and we need to talk about it, and we need, we need to, you know, think about it. How do we actually Okay, so our approach is to bring that science and that discipline, that methodology, in, especially in the leadership and culture side. We don't discount the practice and behavior and the structure. You've got to do that too, but this is less well known. So we're going to be talking about that. So to just give you a little context, um, this is, think of this as a meta framework. Think of this as a meta framework, right? So it's a it's a all it's a like a wrapper around things that you could put in here or use or tools. It's a way to uh, a big picture view of how to map things. You could put anything inside of here in each quadrant, but this is a way to think. It's a systems thinking tool. Is what it is. So you can put, for instance, situations in here, and we will do that. Or you could put other frameworks in here. You could put Sage in here. You could put Scrum in here. You could put Less in here. Um, you could put lean thinking in here, and, and we will do a little bit of that. But the idea is that it's a holistic framework, and you're not leaving out the different methodologies that you need to think about, thinking about them all. So we're not going to go over all the detail of this words. Um, you know, we could just sort of mentally blow them away. Don't, don't pay any attention to them. Uh, um, what we want to orient you to is that on the right-hand side, you have things that are measurable 
and tangible. On the left hand side, you have things that are um, have depth to them or meaning, and they are not measurable. They are intangible or subjective. And at the top, you have things that are individual. This is the individual perspective at the bottom. <laughs> it's a collective perspective. Because collective and individual things are different. Collective things have emergent properties to them that individuals don't use. So this was a uh, guy named Ken Wilbur invented this base thing, not, not this particular version of all this is ours, but um, of seeing the world as I, we, it, and its, or first person, second person, and third person, because that was his analysis of all the world's knowledge is either from a first person or a second person or a third person perspective. And that's a lot of times why people argue with each other is because one thinks the first person is right and the other person that thinks the third person is right. And he said, yeah, come on. They're all right, they're just partially right. So how can we see the world integrally and work from all those points of view? Integral is actually a really big movement. Um, we went to the European Integral Conference this year and it was just um, hundreds of people, 600 people, 600 people there. Um, so this is, a, this is the, the world is moving this way because we naturally want to think this way, right? Our organizations kind of stifle us a lot. And so uh, the world is asking us, begging us to think differently. And so that's why these movements are coming, coming about, like the consciousness movement. So this may or may not make sense enough now. We're just trying to give you a little bit of a feel. We're going to go into detail. Um, the other thing is that the, 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 these things called altitudes, these concentric circles from amber to orange to green to teal, go from less complex to more complex. And they do that in each quadrant. Okay. Now the quadrant is not a place to be. It's a, a platform to look from. So I'm always looking at something in the middle, and I'm looking from an I perspective or a we perspective or an inner its perspective. From, a, from maybe an introspection to a measurement, empirical, to a systems thinking, tangible, to a, um, uh, a energetic field, relationship space point of view. That's the methodologies that I use for in each. So they expand out, if you look from, from amber up to teal, they expand out and go wider because the, the higher the altitude, the higher the level, the more perspectives you're able to take. Because you've got a higher view and you can take the perspectives that you've had before that and include those. But now you've got more and more perspectives the higher you go up. Okay, if this is a little fuzzy, that's fine. But is something just completely and utterly confusing to you right now? Center to edge, increasing complexity. complexity. Complexity or abstractness or scope, complexity. But that'll become clearer as we go through it. Okay. That's what we're going to mainly illustrate, actually, is what it's like to move from one level to the next. Right, so what we're going to do, the way we're going to explain it, we've explained, the, we've explained this um, model different ways, and we're trying uh, this this way out. Um, so we're going to start by orienting you around the altitudes. And we'll start with amber. So if we start in the we quadrant, the we quadrant is about organizational culture and relationships. Right? So if we're standing in conformist amber, kind of what the word says is conformist amber. So conformist amber, this is a way of valuing things together. So we value certainty, we value control, we value the ability to scale things up to do bigger things than we used to be able to do. Predictability, we value predictability. We know what we want, and we know what our, our function is in it, and we know how everyone should play in this, and that's what we like. We don't like the unknown, we don't want to risk things, we really like to just have our, our predictability and our job and know what we do. And so we, we don't really care much for individuality. We, won't, we put on, when we go into work, we put on a uniform, either literally or psychologically. 
put on a social mask, we call it, because we don't need to be seen as an individual. We're just our rank, like the military. We're just a soldier. So think about, um, uh, we talk about in terms of adult development, socialized mind. We all go through this, right, as we grow up, where young people start, like, really become becoming socialized to a certain group or something that, you know, they want, they're attracted to, that's kind of their, their means of belonging, right? It's about what this group thinks or what society thinks in general, so I'm going to fit in. That's, that's a socialized place. That's what we're talking about here. This is where we find our identity. So if we go over now and look from, from an its point of view, from an organizational architecture point of view, which is like structures and systems, now we're looking at, so if, if you value the world that way, certainty, discipline, order, whatever, then you're going to arrange yourselves, pretty logically, into a hierarchy, where you have this person is above this person is above this person is above this person. And this silo is separate from this other silo, because otherwise it gets too confusing. So I know who, who to go to, because it's an org structure, to get answers. And I like that. I want to know, just tell me what I'm supposed to do, give me my answers, and I know exactly who to go to. Now, this is what enabled um, uh, people to conquer the world with their army, is a structure like this. You know, if you think what comes before it, we don't talk about it because it's not relevant in, in um, modern organizations particularly, but red is, is like Genghis Khan. It's just a horde where you're loyal only to one person, or maybe the leader of your uh, troop or whatever, and everybody's fighting each other for control of that. Mafia. Right? Yeah, the mafia. Exactly. So, so this is what this we is call a pre-modern structure because we're in the in, we're in the quadrant of organizational architecture, with a, which is about the structures and the systems that comprise your organizations. So now you're taking that viewpoint. You're looking at it. That right. Anybody uh, have this kind of? This very hierarchical familiar in your uh, structure in an organization that you've worked for in the past or now? That's sure. I'm not very either. <laughs> how does how does Agile play in this? Not very well. Not very well. That's, uh, as well as uh, uh, the Persian army is uh, Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, uh, if we come over to practices and behavior to it, and if we think about um, uh, uh, how we create products here, you know, we call it process centric. We create products by the book. We create products by the, the manual that the experts that were, you know, product designers created for us, and we just follow the rules. And that's not unreasonable on a certain level. A hundred years ago, it was really reasonable. And this is my, you know, my job. I don't necessarily know much about the customer, who even the customer is, but I know this is the role I play, the function I play when we're creating a product. Right? So you, see, you see how disparate this is? I mean, I mean, if you tried to introduce Agile there, would it hit the wall? Yeah. Probably pretty soon, right? This, and that, that's the, you know, any government uh, organization have at least some quality of this, right? Some, some, uh, and many of our our organizations, Fortune 500 organizations, still have a lot of that in it, right? That's why you hear, now we're jumping over here into thinking, right, mindset. You hear, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. And no, we can't do anything else, right? It's that, this is how we do it. So here, the science is um, uh, different developmental levels. In, in I especially, these are invariant. You don't skip between levels. You don't skip from amber to, to green. You go in order. And some people don't stay at a given level. So the reactive level is also called the problem reactive. It's oriented toward problems. It's oriented toward creating or, or getting rid of problems, especially the symptoms of problems that create anxiety and emotion. It's driven by anxiety. It's what firefighting all these problems. But that's, that's not just like a kind of an unfortunate thing that some people do. That's deeply rooted in their internal operating system. It's actually a negative feedback loop structure that can't do anything but, but maintain the status quo. That's just what it's designed to do, and so that's what it does. Well, and that's what it's always does. So all of us are there, 
for a while because that's how we get good at something. So right, so we're 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 developing. Uh, we're younger. We get really good at something, and the then we start using certain strategies to solve problems. Now that works for simple or complicated strategies or problems, but it doesn't work for complex problems. So that's we get stuck in this re, you know problem reactive or we use reactive tendencies, which are the things that we know to do that we always do in a time of stress. Or as Michael was saying, when there's a problem and there's a threat, <coughs> right? So we just jump to that way of operating because that's all we know. We haven't. We haven't, we haven't moved past that yet. We don't see another perspective yet. We haven't seen that. And you see how that mindset then reinforces all the other pieces of being amber. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're in this world, if you're seeing the world from an amber point of view, um, Agile is going to be really hard. Agile is probably going to be impossible if you really are in the amber world. You might, you might go through the motions. You might call what you do a stand-up. It's just not going to be a stand-up. Right. Let's go. We got. Uh, We want you to also start looking for where's my organization. It might have aspects of any of these, but it's going to have a center of gravity. Almost certainly. Most of it has a main way of thinking. And there are going to be pockets, probably, of amber, orange, and green, and even teal. There's some people in there that are thinking this way. So there's going to be pockets, but as Michael said, there's usually a center of gravity. All right? Uh, just for my own edification, we're on the same way with the definitions. Could you uh, define complexity and complicated and how, how they're actually different? Uh, complicated is a Ferrari engine. Okay. Complex is a rainforest. Yeah. Um, if you know enough, you could disassemble and reassemble a Ferrari engine. You, no amount of knowledge will help you save a rainforest necessarily. There's too many interactive variables. variables that you don't know what's going to Create immersion conditions that you don't know. It's too it's too difficult. To yeah, complexity is a lot about emergent behavior, emergent complex systems that are are going to happen as a result of the interactions and technology and the way technology is changing so fast. So we are in a complex world now. We are not in a complicated world anymore. And people a hundred years ago were not in a complex world from many points of view. From some point of view, maybe they were, but but from a business point of view. Which the world is, could be treated as complicated successfully. Which is why, you know, that's the constant, if you're on LinkedIn, you see constant articles about this, that because leaders know, oh my God, you know, I mean, that they're kicking them out the door in two years or less because, you know, they got to hurry up and change this, you know, organization around, innovate, whatever, because, because of the complexity of the world. Is that? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. <coughs> So complicated, I could say deterministic. Uh, yes. Um, that wouldn't be the main feature I picked yeah. up there, but but I, I don't think that's it could be a complexity yeah. definitely not. Deterministic. <laughs> okay. Chief and orange. Chief and orange. Well, chief and orange. When you why you would make the move? So what happens is the evolution happens over time, right? So. The move was made from conformist amber to achievement orange because people started saying, you know what, I'm just kind of tired of being a cog in the wheel. Like, I have ideas, I, I, I'd like to achieve, I'd like to accomplish things that you know matter to me a little bit more. So people get tired, people got tired of that. They wanted more. So that's how we started the move into achievement orange, where now things are about achieving and results. We want to accomplish our goals, we want to innovate, we want to create new stuff. We want to get something done. 
you know, here I had all these ideas, but they were stifled. Like I couldn't tell any, nobody would listen because that's not your job. Now I can actually, as long as it, you know, meets the requirements of the, the goal the organization is after, I can bring my ideas to the table. This is where innovation started happening. Innovation, accountability, the idea of meritocracy. In Amber, I, I move up because of my seniority. If I pay my dues and I stay there for 20 years, sorry, dude, if you've only worked here five years, forget about it. I've been here 20 years. Whereas in Achievement Orange, that's not true. What you know? What have you accomplished lately? Right. That's what counts. But then the unhealthy version is you're only as good as your last sale, <laughs> right? You know that whole mentality, mm -hmm. like you know, achieve or that's it. Um, so the unhealthy version of this is literally you know so competitive that you would step over who you have to step over to, to climb that corporate ladder. You get a little right? greedy. You get transactional with people. Right. All right. So we move over into the um, its quadrant, organizational architecture. So modern architecture, if you value results and goal attainment and whatever, then you're not going to organize just by silos because that's not how work gets done. Work gets done in many organizations through projects. So you're going to have a matrix organization that you know optimizes project managers and project management and getting stuff done through projects. And so you're going to put that on top of the functional uh, silos. You might emphasize that more, you might emphasize it less, because you're, you're still coming from Amber, you've still got that structure that developed usually. You probably would not start an organization that way, but there's not many orange organizations starting that now. So most of our, our modern organizations that are orange are very um, project-based, not product-based, right? We're trying to, in Agile, we're trying to move them to more product-based structures. The uh, performance management system here, because that's policies and stuff that are its thing. Performance management is going to be individually oriented. It's going to be competition oriented. It's going to be what did you do, not what did your team do. That's just the way that, that Orange thinks. So when you keep this kind of structure in place, what did your what did you do? Makes it very difficult to bring in agile practices, right? Where it's more about the team and those that's the, the wall that we hit, the you, rub that we feel. You felt that rub, haven't you? Sure. Okay, so we go up into its, we're at what we call goal center. Now this is totally focused on the product. So this is waterfall. You know, this is scope, schedule, and budget. I've got a plan, I'm gonna achieve the plan because that's what we do. We predict how things are gonna go. We manage how things are gonna go because that's how we achieve goals. So that's how we're gonna develop our product. Customer, they're sort of on the side. It's not that we don't care about the customer at all, but that's you know mainly scope, schedule, budget. All right, and we move into the leadership and mindset quadrant again. We're in the orange. In the orange, we're moving. Uh, this isn't mapped exactly because this this uh, evolution thing, but we're moving from a less reactive to more outcome creating. So less problem reacting to more outcome creating. So we're moving from that um, socialized mindset to a self-offering mindset where I have a purpose in this, right? I play a part in this. I have, a, I have, I want to uh, create outcomes that matter to me too. Right? And I'm moving from tactical oriented, telling people what to do, to more strategic oriented, and letting people figure out what to do as long as they achieve a goal. I care about goals now and goal attainment, not so much about how. So in my organization, I might say, okay, I'll give you some autonomy, but if you don't, you know, achieve the you know, the sprint for some people who are really stretching it here, you know, then you know we're we're going back to the old ways, right? It's very still. I'm not sure. I'm playing. I'm, I'm moving up. I realize there's value here. Okay, is this still are we still good? Is this sounding familiar now? The orange. This is the orange worldview. Is it? Is it resonant? How many people work in companies like this? Yeah. I think most of you were very good at this time. I'm not Or I am wrong. You did. All right. So we're going to hit the <coughs> green now. Nope. Did you purposely leave out a word to describe the reactive transition? Um, no, we. There's, in, 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 in this methodology, 
We're, so the framework that we're using is this the leadership circle over here, okay. reactive and creative. Yeah. And so there's actually, it, it's in the transition, which actually many people are in the transition. Um, they don't label it. Okay. Bill Joyner labels it as uh, an expert achiever, catalyst it's achiever. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't map to these things. And we, you know, this, as Brian said, we're giving you a little taste of things because mm -hmm. we have, you know, an hour half. So we would normally get right, you know, into this this leadership mindset to circle here and do some work there. Yeah, so we, we can spend, you know, a couple of days literally on, on this. But we're just, and you could put, you know, this is a meta framework, remember, so you could put a different leadership methodology here. There's no, there's nothing that's right about this. It happens to be the one that we use because it makes sense to us get results from it, but it's not the only possibility. All right, so now we're moving to green. So we start in the culture quadrant in green, <coughs> pluralistic green. So how do you move from, switch. how do you move, why, why do people move from orange to green? Why did society do that? Well, we got tired of being told what to do and um, we can't, you know, take everybody's perspective, uh, you know, the, the, the goal side and the process side and the meeting numbers and all that was all people cared about, the corporate rat race, whatever, same thing. And now that doesn't mean so much to us anymore. I really like, you know, we're people here, right? What about the human side of this? You know, these are, some of these are my friends, right? So why, why don't we hear more perspectives? Why can't, why can't we have more decision making by consensus, right? So that's what's starting to happen with pluralistic green. It's that move from being really desiring and wanting to move out of that competitive, you know, um, just process side of things to human side of things. So are you starting to f uh, sense uh, agile values? Yes. Agile are very green values. Yeah, so agile, we collaborate. We want face-to-face -face communication, right? We want those things. So Agile is coming in and it literally, when we bring it in, it's, if, whether the organization is amber or orange, we're going, wherever you are in all four of these quadrants, we're pushing you over here, right? That's, that's what Agile, Agile is trying to shift up where our organizations are. And from one point of view, that's great. And from another point of view, that's naive. Because that's not the way it works. That's not the way change works or growth happens. If I go over to structure, postmodern, um, I'm going to have a flat organization, right? If I value inclusiveness and consensus and whatever, <coughs> I'm not going to have a bunch of layers. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to have a flat organization structure. I'm not even going to want people to be managers. I'm not going to like that title anymore. I'm going to you know, think about all kind of tricky workaround <laughs> titles for managers. Make sense? Then we would jump into the practices and behavior, the, the it quadrant. Now we're getting more customer centric. And of course, Agile is this. We're bringing in the product owner. You need to you know, show something to the customer every couple of weeks. You know, so we're pushing our organization from goal, pro, you know, focus on the product, to now let's focus on the customer. Lean start, all those things. This is where we're trying to push organizations. Broader perspectives. Now we don't forget the fact that we still have scope, schedule, budget. We don't forget the fact that we still have processes we're using. They're different processes, but we still have processes, right? <coughs> we don't lose all that from before, but now we're expanding more. Now our centrical focus is the customer, okay? And then if we come over to uh, leadership mindset, um, we have this thing called the creative work. Uh, don't be confused that that has anything to do with artistically or creative solutions per se. It has to do with creating outcomes, outcome creation. And it's a different operating system. So reactive was a negative feedback loop driven by anxiety. Creative outcome creating is a positive feedback loop driven by passion, by vision. So when I'm in reactive down here in amber, what matters is outputs. Right? When I'm in orange, what matters is outcomes. Right? When I'm in green, what matters is outcomes that matter to me. And to us. And to us. Right? So you see how it's getting bigger picture. That's the sense of less complex to more complex. So 
taken more into account. We have to, you know, to create outcomes that matter to us, we have to know us, not just me. We have to know what other people think about. All right, we're gonna take it to you and then we're gonna start getting into the diagnosis. Okay. Um, maybe I'm, uh, so as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, why does it, if the organization changes on its own, or is moving outward in the diagram, I'm wondering why, you know, why does an organization move from being goal-centered to customer-centered? I don't think I've heard you talk about that. Maybe you don't need to. Is that just a question to put aside? Be well, <coughs> because society, the world is changing that way, right? So we, customers, want more, in, uh, the way we were creating products and putting it out there, using like a waterfall for instance, is, you know, we would spend all this time, you know, getting requirements and doing all that and then deliver something yep, that the customer yep. never wanted. So yep. technology is moving faster, we're in complexity, so complexity forces us to start thinking about the customer more in the creation of the products because we were losing sight of the customer and then we're delivering stuff and you can't do that anymore or you're out of business. So can I go from the center to the edge and in each quadrant I, could, I would find that complexity is driving an organization to move from one yes. Yes. level up? Yes, yes. The, the, okay. so these, are all, these are all adaptive systems in us or our structures that are corresponding to environmental <coughs> conditions. The problem is that the environmental conditions evolve faster than we do a lot of times. And so then where Carol is, uh, is going to go, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, find ourselves in over our head, is what we say. Anybody find themselves in over their head? We think their leaders are? Um, we all are. In over your head drowning or in over your, oh, I'm not smart. Oh, oh I don't have a confidence. Um, I've never been here before. I'm not sure. No one's ever done this before. I'm not sure what to do. Uh, and, and it's, you know, Einstein's, um, you can't solve a problem at the same level of complexity that the problem is created. You have to have a higher level of complexity to solve that problem. That's why being in over your head is a great thing from a developmental point of view. Or a horrible thing from an adaptive, from a you know, result point of view, because you're in over your head, and so you're not going to measure up. So, you know, to me, in the environment we're in, everything would be teal if we were actually being responsive to what's true. Because we live in a teal or an even more complex world right now, and we just don't match it. And that's the source of most of the pain. Well, and the key to change or to shifting is to realize <coughs> that it's the awakening of knowing you're in over your head and I need to do something different. That is the whole key. It's self-awareness is the whole key. Awareness of all of it. That's the only way you can actually shift up in any quadrant. The awareness, we are not where we need to be. We, we, we're in over our heads. We've got to do something different. That's why they bring in all these consulting companies and pay millions of dollars for people to help me. Because we're in over our head, right? We don't want to go out of business. The, the, the problem that we have as Agilists is we've got these really cool things and we try to transplant them into this soil that's not ready to receive them. That's the problem. We, we're, we are the future. We do see the future. We just don't know how to get there from where we're at. Now, that's there are people that are ready. Those are the people we want to try to work with right off the bat, right? There's people begging for this. They're ready. They've got the wake-up call. All right, so All right. last round. Deal. Thank you. You're so this is completely different than the other ones, okay? This is called the second tier, and it's completely and utterly different. This now is driven by our purpose together. At Green, we had values that were important. Here we have purpose that drives everything we do, including how we get somewhere. So now we don't worry about consensus. We empower people that we hire. We think they're aligned with our purpose because their purpose is similar to our purpose, and we trust them to do what it takes. So they don't have to talk to everybody, they don't have to get permission from somebody, 
we're going to trust them to do what it takes. And we want them to talk to other people and get input, but not to be hamstrung and wait for everybody to agree. That's going to take forever. These are purpose-driven organizations. So even though it may not be their, they're not necessarily a nonprofit, you know, for a sole purpose, but they realize they play a part in society for changing the world. So there's, or we visited an organization recently. It's it's a mortgage. You know, their basic business was mortgage. But they are society driven because they're changing the way their whole society thinks about things. They're, they're shifting their community, right? They realize that the, the city needs to be revitalized. We can play a part in that, right? Yeah, way more beyond just being kind of a good corporate citizen and being seen to be, you know, that's an orange perspective. Let's be seen to be a good corporate citizen. You know, a green perspective if we really want to, and a teal perspective is we're just going to change stuff. Right. How do I, as an organization, change, you know, the whole game of, you know, equality? Organizations have a responsibility for that. That's who's going to change it, right? That's more evolutionary teal. I'm not just in this to make money, right? Orange wants to treat things as externalities. That's why orange wants pollution to be somebody else's problem. Oh, you created that pollution, so you should be financially responsible. That's good economics from a, from a teal point. But no, Orange wants to treat it as an externality, it's called, which is outside of its scope. Well, that drives up profits, but it doesn't help the plan. So if you want to be a teal organization, you're probably going to change your hiring practices. You're going to take your time, like some organizations I've gone to work for. It's like six, seven, eight interviews, because they want to make sure you're a culture fit, right? That's what we're talking about, about culture. From okay. uh, architecture. So um, this term about meta-modern, don't worry about that. But um, it's an adaptive structure, so now I'm not going to be pure, say, flat. I might have leaders, but I'm not going to have a hierarchy. We're not going to have a silo or anything like that. I'm going to be adaptive to what the situation needs. Sometimes you need a team leader. Sometimes you need an area leader. Um, but it's gonna, this, the organization is going to shift somewhat, depending on what we're working on or what the environmental conditions are, what the economic conditions are, who we have. Yeah. Okay, we move to practices. When we're talking about um, teal or things I was just mentioning, like society centric. So we're focused more than just our organization. We actually look out and we look into society. So what are the things that we do, the practices, the behaviors, what are the things we do that actually show that we're society? This is something that we try to do a transformation in, in that we are not looking for all the transformation business. That's not our goal in the least. Our goal is to change the industry. Our goal is to change how everybody thinks about transformation. We want to be a model of that, but we want to train everybody and shift everybody's mindset to do that, not, not just do that ourselves. Okay. So that's the kind of altitude tour. How are we doing? Good. All right. Should we, should we go over another couple of slides quick or just go to the... So, well, I mentioned, yeah. so I mentioned in the beginning using this as a systems thinking tool. So if you're trying to develop your capability to have more you know, systems thinking, to look at, you know, have a wider or broader view and how do you get down and see where the problems, this is a really great way to do it without being, it's not really prescriptive like we said earlier. And so we use this to um, take a problem, put it in the middle, and let's diagnose the situation from a full um, holistic viewpoint from all four quadrants. Because there's something about this in every single, every challenge you look at, no doubt there's something going on in every quadrant. And we miss it because we have biases towards a quadrant. Because we, you know, we like a specific quadrant, or maybe two, and we default go there. And most people, like we said earlier, are very comfortable on this external because it's things we can see, touch, check a box. We've done this. Oh, yeah. We, so we're very comfortable here, but we're less comfortable with what the world likes to call the fluffy stuff, <coughs> which is really not so fluffy. So would it be fair to say that one quadrant drives the others at one level? For example, when we were the lowest, it was basically the leadership board that kept us way down. And as you move well, up, you get the organizational culture of the board but that then drives all the other quadrants as well. Not exactly. 
I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that orange has a bias for the left-hand quadrants, for sure. It prioritizes them and it marginalizes the left-hand quadrants. Um, green uh, prefers the left-hand quadrants and, and somewhat ignores the right-hand quadrants. Um, teal pays attention to all of them. That's what it means to be in a row. Not so much that one drives. I, you know, you can argue, I mean, we're biased toward the, the I quadrant, honestly, from the point of view of leadership development. We think that changing mindset and leaders at the top can change everything. But if they don't deal with the structures or the practices, ain't nothing gonna change. Uh, so you can, you can get your high, high level <coughs> shift there to enable the others, if that makes sense. Yeah. So maybe when we start going through this, it'll also become a little more concrete. Yeah, is that good? So what we're going to do is we're going to give you um, a conflict. It's just a team level conflict. It's not going to be an organization conflict. Okay? And this conflict is something probably many of you have seen if, you, if you're doing Agile. You have a tester and developer. They're in a stand-up. They're having this big old argument. The, the tester wants to take a bug, and he wants to put it in the bug tracking system and you know, log it in there and do, do all that work. And the developer is telling him what an idiot he is and how that's not agile, and um, I'm not going to do that. Now, there's no reason for that. We can fix this right away. It only takes a little bit of time. Why are you trying to do that? You know, and so they're in this stand-up, this daily scrum, and they're arguing about this. Okay, so that's our scenario. Okay, you've seen something like that. Okay. Okay. Seems like a simple enough thing. There's a lot going on here. All right, so we're going to go start with this one. Right. So I'm the tester, and I'm in this argument. And in my mind, I'm like, man, I really hate conflict. I don't know if I can express myself well enough. I don't want this. I hate this. I'm uncomfortable right now. He's not going to like me. Uh, my team is going to be mad at me for having this conflict right now. But i got to please my boss, because my boss said I have to do this. Uh, and so I, I really need to make him understand somehow that I need to put this in the defect tracking system. And the developer is saying, um, that's the dumbest thing. I'm not going to do that because that's not what you do Agile. I know how to do Agile. Um, that tester must be too dumb to know how to do Agile. I'm, I'm not, he's got to do it. That's just, or he's got to not do it. That's just ridiculous. Um, I, I, yeah, I know this is the right way to do it because this is the agile, this is what's going on in the developer's mind. Right? Some of it might be coming out and the words are saying to each other, but basically this is what's going on in the mindsets of the two. And very and, different mindsets, would you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is both of their reactive is triggered. <clears throat> and when two people's reactive is triggered, guess what happens? You think it goes toward resolution or toward keeping the fight going? Keeps the keeps the thing going. In, in, in its own way. So that's one aspect we can see from this point of view is that both of their reactors are triggered. We see that the tester is what we call a complier, the developer is what we call a protector, and they're going to hook each other. And that's going to be hard. So these are strengths that create our self identity. So in our developmental tool we use, Leadership Help, we, we use this one, we think about three different reactive tendencies. In those reactive tendencies, there are strengths that got us to where we are today. So if I'm a controller, I want to excel, I want to achieve. Many CEOs are come from this place, right? They're very good at creating companies and achieving and, and being the best and winning. So that was a, that's been a strength for them their whole life. But they run over people in the process. They don't care about the body count. That's a deficit. At some point, that doesn't work anymore. Compliers are sort of the complement or the opposite. They uh, like meeting, or they like being uh, pleasing to people. They like belonging. They like being liked. They <coughs> hate being disliked or being outside the pack. So they have a harder time making a decision or taking a stand for something because of that. And protectors uh, like to be right or like to be cut off from the debate or the conflict or whatever, either by being superior to it or by being just criticizing it in some way. Yes. So these are the, the core 
ways of how we're using our reactive, our problem reacting, we talked about earlier, that's what this is. This is the problem reacting we're doing, but it's coming from, as you see in the middle, it's coming from our identity, the, the, the things that we believe are true of ourselves. It's our self-identity, it's the thing we believe, the stories that we made up of what makes us good at something is this. So we're trying to do two things with this. We're trying to see or assess what's happening and we're trying to think about what we might do from an intervention point of view. So this is already giving us some ideas. We're seeing that there's reactive, two reactives that are hooked. We're seeing how it is. We're thinking we could work with them in terms of their leadership development and maybe grow themselves. Okay. So the idea is we're looking in this quadrant and we're kind of seeing what's going on for them besides this <coughs> outward fight that we see. What place are they coming from? Now you're not gonna be able to read their mindset, right? <laughs> But, but this is, you're observing their behavior, and you're kind of getting a sense for where are they coming from. I'm trying to differentiate controlling from protecting, so it's an example, because I kind of see a bit of, because uh, there you say the person dominates the fear, the person feels superior. You see like, a, is there like a fear difference? Um, yeah, a protector is going to be, um, uh, they're not going to be outwardly actually trying to control. They might seem controlling in terms of their mental attitude about it, but it's more, um, it, it might be loud, but, but it's not trying to take over the situation. They think it's of controlling, or, yeah, think of controlling, it's more about your will, right? And think of protecting, it's more about your head, your mind, you know? The, the protector sees things and, and dislikes that they're out of whack with what they see. The, 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 the controller um, feels things not getting done, so they vote <coughs> because they want things to get done. Right. And the compliance is more about okay. <coughs> Could one be both? Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. but, but you're going to have a predominant style. Everybody has a go-to place, even if they have also some of the other positions. All right, so this is kind of what we're doing and what we're using in this quadrant to really diagnose what's going on in the mindset for this particular problem. Okay, if I go to practices and behavior, what do I see? One, these people are arguing in the stand-up. What? Shouldn't you have any argument in the stand-up, should you? Where's the scrum master? What the heck? Where's the team? Why don't they have agreements about this? Why isn't Steve team saying anything? It's supposed to be an agile practice. This isn't right. Right? There's something to look at there. Why, so why is this happening? What's going on? If we go here, okay, so here, well, if we take a look at this in the situation which we've already diagnosed. That's right, well, well, so we did some research and we, we did some research out. and what we found out is that, oh my gosh, these people are reporting to do different managers. And guess what? The managers measure them in different ways. Huh. Right? So, well, so why, you know, nice, I wonder, I wonder if these managers know that this problem exists. I wonder if anyone's ever told them, talked to them. You know, the tester is measured by how many defects that he tracks. Hello? Okay. You know, so what's the cause of this problem? For the point is structured, the way it's structured. Well, maybe, but, but it's also that, that, that they're, you know, ha having uh, arguments and stand-ups, and it's also that they're both reactive. If they, if they were creative, they would not be having that argument like that. They would be having a very different, more, more outcome creating a solution to this problem. It would be more of the win-win-win way of dealing with this. How do you actually dealt with that situation? The problem was over there when you killed one of the managers? Killed one of the one managers? Then you're going to have a different problem. You're going to have a legal problem. Uh, uh, okay. That's the uh, managers we killed. Uh, uh, right. sure. The point is that there are different ways to start working on this problem. Maybe I can't change this right away, maybe I can, right? The point is, I don't ignore it, I see what I can do, I look into this, right? But maybe I can't go there first. So if I can't totally change the structure, how do I work on this, or how do I work on this? Right, that's the point, that you can't miss that there's ways to start dealing with what you're seeing as a problem. Well, that's true. Yep. If I look from a culture point of view, I'm probably in um, an achievement orange culture. Why? Because in a pluralistic green culture, I just probably wouldn't be having that argument that nasty kind of way. Um, I just wouldn't because, you know, we're going to um, 
uh, value. We, we might want to, but we wouldn't. But if we valued people over that, then we would have more um, like conflict resolution. Um, you know, that would be important to the organization. How do we deal with conflict? That that wouldn't have just just you know these two people wouldn't continue to be a problem with each other, right? We would actually be working on conflict resolution in our organization because it's something we value. And in our team, we might have conflict protocols or ways we deal with conflict. We might have agreements about you know we don't have you know um, a personal attack conflicts, right? That would be a different way to work with this. So. Okay, so the point is, no one right way, lots of different possibilities that you see when you look at this way. So, now we want you to do it. You ready to do it? It's your turn. So, think of a problem right now. If you could take it up a notch to more enterprise, that'd be great, but if you just got a team thing, just for the sake of practicing, get into triads, maybe? Triads? get into some triads and bring your particular problem. Make sure you can articulate it succinctly though, because you can't go on and on and on about the problem for 10 minutes, right? Write you it on the card. Write it on the card. You have an index card, okay? So write the problem on your index card. You're gonna take that problem and you're gonna stick it right here in the middle, like on our diagram was. You're you gonna put it right in the middle and then you are going to kind of coach, here, coach each other, work with each other, help each other think. Like systematically walk through the quadrants and, and, and think we, about that problem from each quadrant. We what we want people to uh, imagine a little cross on the floor or something. Yeah. Not, somebody can use this, but not everybody can use this. But we really suggest you walk it because it's different when you shift your body and when you look from this perspective. It really changes something in how you. And here's here's one thing that we 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 don't really have time to get into in this talk, but. Also, we encourage you to think about your own reactiveness, like your own way of how am I potentially also hindering the progress based on my reactive tendencies, right? Because we're first the problem, always. So I can't take my organization further than I can go. So if I'm here and I'm seeing this particular problem, but I'm over down here, always in reactive, how am I going to ask people to be green, you know, agile, when my way of being is more reactive, right? So how am I potentially the problem? So as you're going around, just think about yourself and how you've been dealing with the situation, okay? And All right. For the, so for the folks on the, the live stream, um, you can uh, try this at home if you like. Call up a colleague, get your spouse involved, your children. <laughs> Your dog. Dogs are particularly useful. Sure, your spouse will have lots of good, useful information. <laughs> and we're going to come back in. What do you think? Well, what time do we have right now? It's uh, 7.46. So I'm going to try 20 minutes and see how that goes. We, I know we're done at 8.15 minutes and then see how we're doing. Yeah. So please Problem. See, everybody, everybody's writing a brief problem, maybe one or two bullets on, on an uh, index card, and then one at a time, you'll you know, have that be the focus and the other people will help them. So you might have to vote problem. on which one you want to do in the you know, interest of time. Pick the one that seems like the easiest one to, to, to try out first. You might be able to do two. Uh, never know. Time. <clears throat> well, we write it in Okay, let us know if you have a question. Thank you.
Some of the big ones are small teams that are
hit a wall? What do you mean by like, hit a wall? Stuck. You're oh, stuck. stuck. Like, like you're hitting your head against the wall, or you you reached a glass ceiling, or you. Well, it's just the lack lack of uh, skill set yeah. that everyone else has around you. Either it's um, about about maybe we need to what the developers are doing, or the business value, or um, what specific colors are doing. Um, just the communication when you're trying to put business and IT together, trying to have a common understanding of what the customer wants and that outcome behavior that we're looking for. So you release something that's not going to be you know, sent back and get this all done. Okay. But just yeah, this at least helped to, so for example, in my financial case, at least helped to identify the root cause of the problem. So just for example, we thought we we're, we're, you know, we're going there with the machine oriented and a modern structure. Yeah. And the so we saw, on our, we saw that our leadership is more still reactive. And hence, we're not going to be able to push ourselves on that. Right. Yeah, good. So so you can also not just think of this as a systems thinking tool, but think of it as an assessment tool, yeah. right? You can actually use this. Well, in fact, we build our assessment on this, right? So if you're going to design a solution for anything, whether it's a transformation or a culture shift, a culture transformation, or you know whatever it is, before you design something, you've got to assess what you're looking at, right? So this is also a way to assess the situation, the challenge, the, the work you're about to do before you just go ahead and, you know, just design a solution without, right. you know, without really understanding what you're actually looking at. Right, because if you saw reactive leadership was the level of leadership in this company, would you would you bring creative, outcome creative solutions to it <coughs> or expectations? Probably going to be a setup, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do something very specifically and, and actively and vigorously to move that, to shift that, <coughs> if there's a desire to. So if I if I understand that this leader is uh, oriented around achieving, like he's an achiever, Bill Joyner's model, he's an achiever. If I start come in talking agile from a green perspective, and in a way that's more, oh, we got to collaborate, we're going to meet face to face, now you got to shift your whole organization. They're going to be like, whack, 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 right? Like, Show me the money. Forget it. That, that, that kind of talk doesn't work with an mm -hmm. achiever um, person. You've got to meet them where they are, and they might be ready for a shift, but if you talk that talk, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose them. They might be ready. You don't know if they're ready. So. Pay attention to what's in front of you, diagnose it, assess it, look at it, be observant about it, be thoughtful about it before you jump in and how you're going to go do your agile training or how you're going to set this organization up for the transformation, right? It's a conscious thing. This is a mm -hmm. conscious thing. And you right. see how our level of development is really key here. If we're coming from a more reactive place, we're not going to be able to handle other people who are reactive. Mm -hmm. It's going to trigger our reactive, and then we're going to be in a tank. Uh, there are two points. Uh, one thing this reminds me of the whole uh, DNU, right? uh, Chuck Boyd, the captain Chuck Boyd, who never lost his dog fight, mm. comes there. Observe, orient, decide, act. Mm. So that's what I have to have uh -huh. in Dr. Sutherland's book. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But this second point is also, I always, uh, when I try to look for the solution, for this, I always blame the, yeah. these two things, leadership mindset and organization architecture. Uh -huh. So this will, what this will make me do is to look, stare at this a little bit more, and make them think things there, we can help change those two. Yes. Right. Right. And, and so that's what my Perfect, and you might need thinking partners, right. you know, who are, you know, you're specialized maybe in these two, yeah. and, and not so much in these two, and you need people, you know, I mean, I'm, I I'm, don't, don't tend to be an it or any person at all, mm -hmm. blind spot for me. Mm -hmm. I yep. need somebody who, you know, so right. you, you, this, is, this is a team sport. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you talk about what kind of person someone is with respect to this and being to where they are and, like, and being conscious. So that implies a person needs to identify for themselves where they are. 
but it's, but I also think I am hearing that you're saying that as the coach, you recognize different people's types. Okay, but do you tell them what they are? So how do you deal with, you know, everybody needs to know really what the situation is on the one hand, and on the other hand, So, so in a brief answer, this is something we go into a lot of detail in our sure. workshop, right? The folks on that a lot, but um, no, I would just go in and tell them, you know, you're right. you're reactive and you're right. wired, right? right. You know, that would not work, right? right. That would shit roll right. up immediately. Yeah. So, but but I would I would recognize it for myself, and I would gauge how I'm going to work with this leader. Now, now we might, now for us, we go in an organization and we do this right off the bat. Which, in, which gives them data from uh, the 360 instrument, which tells them that they are a controller or a compliance. So you're recognizing this, they need to be self-aware, and that's an exercise yes. to build self-awareness yes. before you come to this yes. conversation. Yes. So okay. that might be part of that solution when you guys were coming yes. up. Right. That for us, that's part of the solution. You need to see what your leadership culture is like, like you individually and collectively, right? So how can I expose that, you know, in a way that, you know, you, that's not a confrontational type of, you know, discussion. It's, they see it from them. You bring them to awareness through a non-confrontational tool or, you know, a way for them to see it. And um, so two things. One is um, change can only start from somebody wanting to, on some level, but also change is motivated by pain. And you have to show them the pain sometimes. You have to show them the pain there. They can, and that's, that's a pain mirror. It's a really pain in the ass pain mirror. I've oh, <laughs> done it myself um, a couple times. Um, it'll blow your mind out. Um, so you've gotta be motivated, but you know they come in and they say, um, we're not getting the results we want. I mean, I mean, you know, the people are inviting you in because they want something different, don't they? Not because they want the status quo, but part of them does. Part of them doesn't. That's the way we are, right? We want um, uh, things to be different. We don't want to do what we have to do to change it. That's the human condition. But that doesn't mean that you have to do this, right? No. It's, it's the awareness of what's important to this leader. Whether I get a chance to do that, because sometimes you just don't have that opportunity right off the bat. So how am I going to start working with them? How am I going to talk to them? How, what are the uh, data? Maybe they're interested in data. How am I going to bring useful data that matters to them? Leaders love data. Leaders love this kind of data because it tells them, you know, and this is tied to, to both leadership effectiveness and organizational business results. It's not, you know, just nice to be a better leader. It makes the difference in whether you have a successful organization or not. How many organizations are really flattened and come to this culture and do we have data to prove them? To data to prove here. Data to prove this model and oh, this yeah. mindset yeah. essentially. Yeah, that's why we say it's it's, it's rooted in scientific um, yeah. Uh, place. Yeah, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data. This has been done all over the world and it's, <coughs> it's got um, a almost close to 2 million raiders in their system and over 150,000 you know, leaders that have been raided. So there's a lot of reason, and this whole model is built off all of the developmental research people out there like Susan Cook Reuter and, and um, Bill Joyner and the key, Robert Keegan and you know, all those people. Their thinking is embedded into this model. So yeah. So the, the cool thing is that we're kind of at a great place in Agile where people are more ready now than ever. You read the articles that are coming out. They're talking about leadership and how can we grow the development of leaders to lead transformation. People are realizing this is totally needed. So we're in a better place with this. And people are talking about consciousness. That's a, you know, transformation used to be out on the edge. Now transformation is commodity. Right? Everybody has transformation. Consciousness is more cutting edge. And that's what 
leads to transformation in our experience from the senior leader, you know, the senior leader has to realize they're the problem. If you're gonna transform, look in the mirror. There's a quote, we maybe end with this, unless there's a question. Um, there's a quote that the leadership circle um, says, which is, your collective leadership effectiveness is your one strategic competitive advantage that no one can copy. Like if you think into that, that is really profound. Your collective leadership effectiveness is your strategic advantage that no one can copy. You're in control. Cool. All right. Any questions? Thank you very much. For Thank you.